Well, good morning, and God bless you. God bless you, and God bless you one more time. Rev Eddie here. Hey, Chris. Uh, it is New Year's Eve 2022. We're going in, saints. We're going in. Amen. And the Lord has given me a beautiful message. And we're going to title this, Don't Give Up Your Hallelujah. Don't give up your hallelujah. I know it's tough, saints. And we're going through. We've got issues, we've got situations, we've got circumstances that can seem overwhelming, but I just want to encourage you, don't let the mess get in the way of your praise. Your praise is a powerful, powerful, powerful weapon. Some teach that the sword, your word, is the only offensive weapon that we have. But I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Your praise is powerful. You have a hedge of protection around you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to this message. Amen. If Satan had his way, you'd be dead. I'd be dead. But God won't allow it. We still go through the circumstances, but they make us strong. You see what I'm saying? And reading your word is that foundation that we stand on. This word is powerful. But your praise, your prayers, they can move mountains. Amen? And we're going to go into a scripture where we can see this uh, play out. Amen? But no matter what you're going through, keep praising. There's a hedge of protection and a wall of fire around you that the enemy cannot take your life. He can't do it. But he's firing his fiery darts over that hedge into your camp, trying to get your attention, trying to distract you, trying to take you off course. Amen? You can launch missiles, spiritual missiles of praise back over that hedge into his camp. Oh, yes, you can. Amen. And our praises will choke the devil's neck, the Bible says. Amen. The enemy's neck, grab him by the neck. He doesn't want to hear you praising God. He wants to hear you praising him. Amen. So when you're going through your situations, praise your way out. Praise, 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 and the walls will come down. Amen? It's a very powerful weapon, and it puts the enemy on the run. That's why a lot of churches start off praising, singing. It's a weapon. Let's clear this church of the enemy so the people can hear this word, that the people will come to the altar They'll leave their burdens. They won't leave here the way they came in. But it starts off with praise. Let's clear the atmosphere. Amen. And so by launching spiritual missiles back into the enemy's camp, it puts him on the run. How can he attack if he's running away from you? Boy, I would leave my praise music on even though I left the house. I might have to run to the store and music play. <laughs> okay? You're not coming up in here while I'm gone either. Amen? Watch this. We're going to go to the book of Acts. Amen? And I want you to take this message that the Lord is ministering into your lives into this new year, 2000. 23. You want to call it a message for the uh, new year? Let's call it that. I'm going to Acts chapter 16, and I'm going to start at verse 16. Amen. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, 
I want to stop there. We. Luke is running with Paul. Okay? He's running with Silas. He's writing this stuff down. Amen? He is just amazed at how the Lord is using Paul and the souls that Paul is saving. The lost are hearing the gospel. Hasn't been printed yet like we have it, but the Lord gave it to Paul. It's in his heart, and he's preaching. He's preaching up a storm. He's laying hands on the sick. They're getting healed. Miracles everywhere they go so that we includes Luke. <laughs> Amen. I marvel at Luke. Paul's in prison, locked up, okay? And Luke's in there with him, and he's not under arrest. <laughs> he's like, Paul, what are we going to do now? You know, let's write. <laughs> Tell the people something. Let's take this down time, and let's write. Let's get this down so the saints coming after you will have this word, will have this walk that you walk, the preachings that you teach, the relationship that you have with Christ. We got to get that out there. They need this. So he's not even under arrest, Luke, but he's there. Woo. Amen. Glory to God. One day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. Now, the Greeks and the Romans, they, they loved these satanic rites and powers and stuff like that. So this poor girl's in bondage and being used by her masters. Amen? Uh, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortune. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Wow. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Okay? What the slave girl said was true, although the source of her knowledge was a demon. Why did the demon announce the truth about Paul, and why did this annoy Paul? If Paul accepted the demon's word, he would appear to be linking the good news with demon-related activities. This would damage his message about Christ. Truth and evil do not mix. Amen? Verse 19 her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Now, these rods cut you, and they swung them with uh, full force. They did that to Jesus, okay? And uh, they, they make you a bloody mess, and the pain is excruciating. Amen? Verse 23 says, they were severely beaten. They were severely beaten. And then they were thrown in prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the 
inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Sometimes in our walk with the Lord, we end up in places we don't want to be. Sometimes circumstances and situations will present themselves in our lives where, why am I going through this? What did I do to deserve this? Looking at it in the wrong way, let's keep reading and watch what God does, how he uses Paul, Silas, Luke. Amen. Around midnight, I said around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Let me stop there for a second. They're praying and singing hymns. Now, these people, I mean, Paul, Silas, they've been beat beyond belief, severely beaten, the Bible said, and they're in prison. Prison back then wasn't no joke, okay? It was unlikely you would be fed unless somebody brought you food. You talk about the cold, they don't have no heaters. Bathrooms? They didn't have bathrooms. So just try to imagine what, where they're at, what they're going through, but what are they doing? They're praying and singing hymns. <laughs> now, Bible doesn't say what songs they were singing. Were they singing Amazing Grace? I don't know. Were they singing the rough side of the mountain? I don't know. Were they singing the blood of Jesus? Mm, mm, mm. I don't know what they were singing. But they're singing. They're praising God. Not looking at the circumstance they're in. They're in prison, and they're bloody, and those wounds are hurting. Amen? They're not focused on that. They're praying. What are they praying? Are they praying for an earthquake? Are they praying that the Lord would deliver them? Because they could be killed by morning. If these city officials get their way, if Satan gets their way, they're dead men. Are they praying for their lives? Now, my study of Paul tells me, no, that wasn't their prayer. Everyone in the prison can hear them praying, can hear them singing. Knowing Paul, he's preaching in them songs. He's preaching through those prayers. He's probably praying a prayer Maybe, like, Lord, if I'm going to die, that's okay. But let me get this gospel out. Let me get your message out. Let me tell them about your love, your mercy, your grace, so they'll get saved. Let's get some numbers here for your church. I know it's dark. I know it's dingy. I know it's smelly, and I know it lacks, Lord, but I'm here. And you allowed this in my life. How many can we get saved here? Come on, Lord. I know in every word that comes out of my mouth to be a blessing to your people. Send, my, send the words coming from my mouth out with power to touch their hearts so that they, they will want your salvation. I don't know what he's praying. Bible doesn't say what he's praying. Bible doesn't say what he's singing. But they're praying and they're singing. And everybody in that prison can hear them. I guarantee you, they were, they were ministering. Amen. Verse 26. Suddenly, and that's how we're going into this new year. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. That's what we're praying for, Satan. All of you out there that are hurting, brokenhearted, church hurt, 
you're in bondage, you're afflicted with that uh, depression or anxiety or PTSD or drugs, or alcohol, sexual activities, you know, that don't line up with the Word of God. I don't know what the bondage is, but God does. And we're declaring right now, chains are falling off. In the name of Jesus, foundations will be shaken. And the prisoners will be set free. Are you getting this? Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all listen. Let me keep going here. Okay? All the doors. Every door. You got doors in your way? They're flying open right now. Right now. And the chains of every prisoner fell off. Let them fall. Let them fall. In the spirit, I want to hear chains hitting the cement floor. Can you hear it? The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. To kill himself. You see, they would have killed him, tortured him, and killed him for the prisoners getting away. That's how it was back then. You responsible for these prisoners. They get they escape, you die. The punishment the prisoners were going to receive will be placed on you, jailer. But Paul shouted to him, Stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. Nobody left. Wow. That's what leads me to believe that Paul was praying for them, for everyone within earshot of these songs and these prayers. Okay? Verse 29. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How do you know anything about salvation? They were listening to Paul. They were listening to Silas. They heard the songs. I am redeemed. Is that what he sung? Is that what the jailer heard? I don't know. I'm just saying. He heard something. <laughs> because now he wants to get saved. Okay, look at the mad respect. He fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. God's holy man. Amen? He recognized something in Paul and Silas. He knew the charges. He knew why, were the, why they were in prison. And he was instructing to beat them unmercifully. But they had something. And one of them prayers, one of them songs, touched his heart. And he said, I need what they got. Life is not worth living unless I can get what they got. Ooh, a message for the lost. Amen. Verse 31. They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Glory be to God. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. <laughs> County Sheriff, <laughs> L.A. County Jail. I don't know if they're going to wash the wounds inflicted <laughs> on the prisoners today, but this jailer did. Amen? <laughs> then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. 
Look how powerful this message is. This gospel. You got to preach it. You got to teach it. There's power in this word. Amen? And this entire household caught a hold of this word and rejoiced and rejoiced. A change of heart. Amen? The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. Hmm. Look at Paul. He got that fire, the Holy Ghost in his chest. Watch how he responds. But Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison. And we are Roman citizens. In other words, we've got rights. And y'all just trampled all over our rights. It goes on, he says, so now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. <laughs> he sees another preaching opportunity, amen. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. They had some church at Lydia's house. Amen. You might be in a place that you don't want to be in. I know. I've been in too many of them in my walk with the Lord. You might be in a hospital right now. You might be in a hospital right now. And I know it's New Year's Eve, that ain't much of a party. But it may not be for you. It might be for the people in the bed in your room next to you. It could be for the nurses could be for the doctors. It could be for the hospital staff. We take advantage of every situation, whether we want to be there or not. I mean, come on. Maybe we'd want to go to a prison if we knew that foundation was going to be shook like it had never been shook before and the doors are going to spring open. But see, Paul didn't know that. Neither did Silas. God knew that. He knows what he's doing. You can trust him. Total and complete with your life. And if he's allowed a situation, a circumstance to come into your life, look at the last two years we've gone through. Look how many loved ones we've lost to this virus. I mean, look how many business owners are no longer in business with these shutdowns. They lost everything. Everything. Who knew it would last so long? I went through the same thing. But we rejoice. And we keep on doing what we can do and let God handle the rest. If he gave it to you once, he'll give it to you again. You don't focus on the law. You see, you focus on God, your provider. Amen? So we've had some exciting guests to end the year with. We had Pastor Ruth come. We've had some testimonies from Tim and a young lady. Uh, we had yesterday, what was it, day before yesterday, we had a beautiful minister from the Caribbean come in with a message from the Lord about forgiveness. Amen. We want our walk to be lined up with this word. Amen. 
We want this word to be our foundation. We need the gifts of the Holy Spirit to get through this life. We need him to shape our walk, to shape us and uh, form us and mold us and make us into these Christ-like figures. Amen? This is deliverance. We need attitudes like Christ, a Christ-like mind. But life has taken us through so many dark paths that we picked up things that ought not be. That's where the power of the deliverance comes in. We can get these demons off of us, this sickness off of us, these strongholds torn off of us, but we got to surrender to Jesus. We got to come to him in faith like that woman with the issue of blood, okay? He didn't pray for her. Oh, you act like he prayed for her. Jesus didn't pray for the woman with the issue of blood. Blood. He didn't extend his mighty, powerful healing hand her, her way. They didn't bring her to him on a mat. She fought her way through a crowd saying these hope-filled words. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. Twelve years she dealt with this bleeding. She'd been to every doctor in town to no avail. The Bible says she was worse off going to the doctor. It was, it was her faith. And she had to get up off that couch and get to Jesus. But on the way, she knew in her heart, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Now, in those days, for a bleeding woman to touch a priest, <laughs> those priests, yeah, those priests claimed they would be defiled. They couldn't touch a dead body without being defiled. They couldn't touch a leper <laughs> without being defiled. Jesus touched them all. Hello. Oh, you all act like I didn't say that. I said that he touched them all without defilement. See, there's man's way and then there's God's way. But when God does it, oh, it's spectacular. It's wonderful. And it's complete. Are you with me? The woman had faith. And after fighting through that crowd, and they didn't want nothing. They just want to see a miracle. They just in the way. People get in our way as we're looking for Jesus, as they were trying to draw close to Jesus. They're just in the way. But she fought through that crowd, feeling as horrible as she felt in her body. But she'd had 12 years of this. Enough is enough in her heart. She's thinking, I got to get to this man. And she touched. And the Lord whirled around. Who touched me? Come on now, you act like he didn't say that. He said, who touched me? Because he knew what had just happened. Peter's like, dude, we're in a crowd. Everybody's touching us. What do you mean who touched us? And the Lord is like, uh-uh, 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 Peter. <laughs> you, you have no idea. I felt power. Leave me. Healing power has left me. Who touched me? I don't know if the woman is thinking, oh, my God, I touched touched the rabbi, I touched the teacher, I touched the Messiah. He's going to get on me because uh, I defiled him because of my condition. And the woman said, it was I, Lord. And he looked on that woman. I could just see the twinkle in his eye, the smile. As he looked at her, 
and said, Woman, you have been made whole. Your faith has healed you. Your faith, it wasn't his garment. Now, don't get it twisted. It wasn't the garment. She came to Jesus. And her faith, her faith healed her. She knew if she could get in the presence of God, that this dreary life, this horrible life, this illness, this sickness, this bondage. She can't go anywhere. She can't go to birthday parties or Thanksgiving dinners or enjoy her family because she's constantly in the bathroom. She's got a condition that has limited how effective her life can be for her loved ones. How can she go to work, go into the bathroom all the time? trying to clean up so she's presentable. You don't even know how that made her feel, this constant bleeding. Had to be an anemic, always tired, always weak. Who knows what she was going through? But we're all going through something. That's what this dark, sin sick world does to us. We're in this world. But see, we're not of it. Uh uh. Uh uh. We're not of it. We're foreigners here. We're God's children. If you will invite Him into your heart, into your life, there's power there. Life saving power. Life changing power. Life rearranging power. You come in the presence of God. You can't stay the same. You know this from my testimony. He touched me, grabbed me by this elbow, took me to hell, and left me there. But when he brought me back out, he did that. I didn't deserve to come out. As I burned in that pit of hell, I knew. I knew in my heart that the way I live, the choices I had made, the decisions that I made in my life had me there. And it was nothing I said, nothing I did while I was burning on that wall that made God let me out. Uh uh. He did that. <clears throat> he did that. He did that. What a wretch I was. I was as filthy coming out as I was going in. But he delivered me from the drug. Was it the touch? I don't know. But I never craved him again. It's been 18 years. I'm free. Now, I still had lots of demons. I had lots of issues that I needed deliverance from. But that power. That power was available to me in Pastor Hubbard's deliverance ministry. And the Lord led her. I couldn't walk in that church without her pouring a bottle of oil on me. Pastor Ruth talked about that. She said she'd just get them all greasy with that oil and pray for them. Maybe that's old school because Pastor Hubbard did that too. And one by one, one by one, those demons left. I was a thief. I was a liar. I was a cheat. I had all this sexual stuff going on. One by one, gone by the power of God. I'm telling you, there is power in the church. Life-saving power. Amen? Every gift is available now that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians. Don't feed into the lie. The gifts didn't die. That's some dead pastors teaching you that. The power isn't gone. Holy Ghost is here in full power. 
working in our lives, making us like Christ. If you see anything good in me, you're seeing his work. He did this, not me. Not me. And it's available for you too. Now we prayed just a couple of days ago, me and Pastor Ruth. The Lord put it on my heart. I'm healing everybody. Everybody. So I don't care what your condition is. I don't care what the bondage is. Okay? Those chains are falling off. Now, let's go into the new year saved and healed and delivered and set free. No stronghold. Do you have the faith to believe Captain Haynes is coming on? Now, this man, he served for 40 years, not only as a pastor, but as a fireman. I talked to him yesterday. His book, I'll show it to you again. His book is called The Book of Miracles. By Ralph E. Haynes, The Book of Miracles. Imagine a fireman watching hand, the hand of God all around his life, all around those stations, all around the cities that, uh, and communities that he had to uh, rescue people in, put out fires, save lives. Just imagine the miracles. They're in this book, and I know it's not all of them, but I talked to him yesterday, and he's just busy. Lord has that man all over this planet. If he ain't on a plane, he's somewhere ministering this word of God. But he's coming home, and I'm hoping to have him on in just a day or two. He's supposed to fly in today, but he's excited. And I've told him what we've been talking about, the issues we're addressing. And... If you don't believe me, I've seen so many miracles. I've seen cancer heal. I had cancer. I've seen leukemia heal. I've seen AIDS heal. I've seen hearts, and I mean medically and spiritually, spiritual hearts heal. I've seen the miracles. You can't write a book <laughs> or form a doctrine that would have me convinced that there's no power. I'm telling you, there is. Believe me, I'm not going to get on here and lie to you. I've seen too much to go back. That's an old gospel song. I've come too far to turn around. I know. I know. And you can have a doctorate in front of your name. You can have a professor. You can call yourself anything you want and try to knock down the work of the Holy Spirit. But I've seen too much. I know it's true. And <laughs> it's God's will that you be healed. The woman with the issue of blood knew that. He healing everybody else. He's no respecter of person. I mean, Romans are getting healed. The soldiers are getting healed and saved. There are enemies. Gentiles are getting saved. Jews are getting saved. Women are getting saved. Men are getting saved. Children. He doesn't seem to care about who it is. I know his will is that I'm healed. And by faith, she ran to him. Amen? Paul's in the most horrible place, as we just read, but he knows God's will. How do, how do we know God's will? Read your word. It's in his word. You want to know him personally? People have asked me. They've said, if you could sum it up in one sentence, how to make it into heaven, what's that sentence? Fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with Jesus. But how? How are you going to fall in love with someone you don't know? Jesus said, seek me in my word. Read your word. Read your word. Get it in you. It's not the job of the pastor. 
on Sunday to give you the word that you need. I mean, it is his job. But that's not all the word that you get once a week. So you open up your Bible once a week and uh, at the pastor's request, and he brings his sermon, and then you close your Bible, get in your car, go home, and that Bible doesn't open until next Sunday. If you make it to church next Sunday, that's not reading your word. You feed that body, what, three, four? How many days, how many times a day do you feed your body? You'll feed the flesh. But what about your spirit? It don't get the nutrients it needs. <laughs> it's deprived. Come on. You got to feed that spirit. Waking up in the morning, you can set the tone for your day by getting in this word. How can you fall in love? How can you walk like, talk like, preach like, teach like, pray like, stay like Jesus if you don't get in this word and learn about it? It's in the gospel. It's in the epistles. It's throughout the Bible. He's even in the Old Testament. What are you doing? Get this word in you. The word is the power that you need in your life to overcome the situations that you're in. Read your word. <laughs> Read your word. Well, I don't have enough time. Make time. It's worth it. Rearrange your schedule. Get up a half hour earlier so you can spend those precious moments before your day starts. I'm going to tell you a secret. Starting your day with the word sets the tone for the day. You don't know what's going to happen. They may be clowning at work. You might not even get to your car and the whole neighborhood's in an uproar. Just you walking out of your door. There could be situations that you got to deal with immediately. Immediately. But you ever get a phone call early in the morning, wakes you up, and they cuss you out and hang up? And now you wrecked all day. Why would they do that? And you calling them back and they won't answer. They done went on about their day. They're not thinking about it. You wrecked the whole day. They set the tone for your day. Amen? You start your day in this word. You set the tone. You get that little praise music going and dancing around in the shower and shouting your way to the uh, closet and getting dressed and ready for your day. Thanking God. Praising God. Glorifying God. You see? You set the tone. Now, no matter what happens, you got that joy. You got that peace in your spirit. You see, you're setting the tone. You are working together with God. You laying on the couch. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. I'm waiting on you, Lord. He's waiting on you. Get up. Get up. Go after him. Look at the people that Jesus was ministering to. These crowds followed him. Where's Jesus? He over there today. He didn't sit in one place. Oh, he over at the temple today. He at the temple. He at the temple. I'm going to the temple. Go to the temple. And they didn't have Ubers. It took effort. It takes effort on our part. Chase after him. He's wonderful. He'll never let you down. And it's worth it. And the issues, the burdens that you're carrying Aren't you tired of it? Aren't you tired of being homeless? Aren't you tired of the drugs? Aren't you tired of the alcohol? Those lifestyles and everything that goes with this. Aren't you tired of waking up 
in a bed full of vomit and feeling all hung over and toe up. You're not tired of that. <laughs> You're not tired. You're not tired yet. It takes so much to live those lifestyles outside of Christ. It takes so much to live in this world. I know. It was hard being a drug addict. You try to score at 3.30 in the morning. Some of the worst dope deals happen at 3.30 in the morning. It was hard. It took a lot of work to stay on. A lot of effort. It don't take that much effort. It don't take that much effort to serve God. I thought I was living when I was a drug addict because I had the drugs, okay? I was a thief. I'm stealing, and I'd work a few hours, and I'd have thousands of dollars, and I could stay high for a week and keep all these girls around, and it's like, that ain't living. I was the walking dead and didn't even know it. This is living. Living for Christ, I found out. You ain't started living <laughs> until you're living for Christ. This is the good life. Is it full of peace? No turmoil? No attacks from the enemy? No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's why if you see a vision of Jesus and he's trying to walk and there's some guy grab a hold of his ankle and he can barely walk and he's dragging him as he's trying to get where he's going. That's me. I'm hugged up on him and I'm never going to let him go. Never going to let him go. It's that good and it's that important. And what if he says to you, depart from me. I don't know you. Well, if you're in love with him, he already loves you. You got relationship. He can't say, depart from me. <laughs> I don't know you. He going to say, child, come on in. His kingdom, <laughs> it's prepared for you. You come on in and enjoy eternity with me. Let's keep it going, y'all. Amen. We're going into 2023. I want to pray. I'm hoping to have Captain Haynes uh, up in the next couple of days. So stay tuned. Amen. Know that no matter what it looks like, that ain't it. It's not with these eyes. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it seems like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what other people say it is, <laughs> that's not it. It's only what God says it is. And has he spoken that last word in your situation? The doctor said there, Pete, have you heard from God? His will is that you be healed. And I pray right now for everyone under the sound of my voice that if you are sick in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, in your emotions, if you're in bondage to anything that's ungodly, I command it right now. I declare right now to these demons, let them go. Cease and desist right now. Let them go in the name of Jesus. Chains falling off, I hear in the spirit. I can hear them falling off. It's not a feeling. You got to know. You got to know in your heart God's will for your life. He wants you saved. He wants you healed. He wants you free of the bondages that Satan and his demons have on you. He wants those strongholds torn off of you that you'll be free to obey him, free to serve him. It is his will. And I pray right now, Lord Jesus, let your mighty and perfect will be done in each and every one of our lives. 
Father, move like never before in the lives of your people. Touch their hearts, Father, from your mighty throne. Touch their minds. Touch their spirits. Touch their bodies. Turn it all around for your good. Heal, Father. Heal their broken hearts. They've been so hurt, Lord. Some of them have been hurt by churches, Lord. Heal their hearts. Heal their broken hearts. And I ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's dash with joy in our hearts into this new year, 2023, expecting, expecting, knowing, knowing in our heart everything's going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right because God is with us. And if God is with us, who? Who could possibly be against us? He's brought us this far all these years. He's been there. Whether we've been 100% his or not, he's been 100% there for us. And that's why we're going to see 2023. Amen? Because he's not done with us yet. Amen? So let's go. God bless you. We'll see you very soon. Amen? Have a wonderful, wonderful New Year's Eve and a very blessed New Year's. Bye-bye.